and welcome to Dub at the Cup. We are live out the front of Sydney Football Stadium where 39,000 fans have just seen France being held to a scoreless draw by Jamaica. My name is Taryn Hedo joining us today. Teo Pelizzari as always and very special guest, A-League Women's Champion, Rola Badawea. Rola, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Rola, we were discussing off air your experiences with the World Cup so far. How have you found the whole thing? Honestly, it's been so amazing. Like, I can't believe I'm actually living in Australia where the World Cup is happening. Like, not many people, if not any, people can say that, you know, they've been to a World Cup where they're actually living. So I think it's, I feel so grateful and blessed to be living here and seeing it live and seeing all of the fans like it's been so amazing to see the women's game is growing so quickly and it's just like it's so heartwarming <laughs> and i'm just so excited about it well i'm looking forward to hearing more of your thoughts rolla as we discuss the games today but also the matildas taron because we do have some new news if you've uh, been following the keep up channels you would have seen pakua frimpong and tom smithies up in brisbane where they reported that tamiki yallop has returned to training alana kennedy was walking laps sam kerr claire hunt and kaya simon did not train however sam kerr did post a gym workout photo on the leg press machine so taron <laughs> that's not subtle if you've got a calf injury and you're on the leg press machine i think that is putting on a brave face for the outside world what do you make of that new from Matilda's training today. Well, that Sam Kerr photo, of course, sends a strong message uh, that she is planning to be back in this tournament, that perhaps speculation about the length of her injury might be a bit overblown. That's the image that she is portraying, of course. Claire Hunt and Alana Kennedy, they were uh, out of training, according to the Matildas camp, with lo a load management issue. So they were just doing things with their runners, walking laps, that sort of thing. Not too much to worry about there, but of course, the really positive news is seeing Tamiki Yallop back in full training. Really fantastic news for the Matildas. Roller, tournament environment and also the Matildas travelling around the country. You got to live that in both the A-Leagues but also in your college experience as well. How do you feel they're handling the expectations of being the favourites but also perhaps the physical workload? I mean, the fact that a handful of players didn't train today suggests that they are managing their team very carefully at the moment. Yeah, I think managing your team is just another part of being a champion. I think... Um, like having Claire Hunt out, just like doing her laps or whatever she's doing, like I think that's a good idea for her because, you know, playing these 90 minutes every single game and she's such a key part to the Matildas and I'm so proud of her. She's done so amazing and just it's been so great to see. Um, I think it's definitely apparent for all of the girls who have been playing these large minutes to get that rest because it's all part of the game. Rest recovery is how you're going to win games. Now, Taryn, uh, former Matildas star Joey Peters tweeted, a warm-up causing injury, referring to Sam Kerr. We should be livid. Our training methods need to be held accountable. Interesting that there hasn't, there's been a, a little bit of chat around the, the how Sam Kerr got injured, but I, I think the, the blow-up about you know, whether or not it was disclosed in the press conference has perhaps overshadowed any actual legitimate discussion. It seems as though Sam Kerr's public face has been able to maybe allay some of the concerns and, and you already suggested maybe a bit overblown. Perhaps and look the thing is about this sort of injury is that it happens all the time throughout the season. People get one week, two week calf injuries constantly. It's just not normally the day before the opening game of a home World Cup and you know that's why it's become such a big story. So yeah, I mean, fair enough, you can have the discussion about the reasons why, but it's just one of those things that happens. It's just terrible, terrible timing. And let's see when Sam Kerr does indeed come back. So let's, uh, Roller, talk a little bit about you because you are our guest tonight. Of course, you <laughs> won the A-League Women's Championship with Sydney FC. Now, uh, we can't talk about what's next other than <laughs> to say we're very excited for next summer for you. But what was your A-League experience like? Because obviously you're from America. It was your first campaign in Australia. Give us a bit of your backstory and tell us how it came to be that you were signed mid-season by Sydney and then you were on the podium as champion by the end of that season. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, every journey is different. So I feel like I have a little bit of a unique story. You know, I, I am from America and... Um, Hence the accent. I get bullied from it all the time, but it's fine. Um, yeah, and so I came here uh, planning to be with my partner. He's um, Australian, and he actually helped me get into the Sydney Uni NPL team. And, 
yeah, I played for Sydney Uni last year and I had a really good season. Um, ended up getting player of the year, so super excited to like get that award and be recognized in, uh, in that light. And so, um, yeah, I didn't get a contract straight away, which is okay, you know, like there's so many things that are gonna happen in, in your career. So, you know, it's just a setback for, you know. <laughs> um, and yeah, so basically after that, um, I got a mid-season call up a little like with Sydney FC, they called me up to train with them and then ended up doing a little bit of trainings and I guess they liked what they saw. So I got to end up signing with them. So that was really awesome. And being a part of that, it was definitely so grateful to be a part of that. And it, it was a little taste. So I'm really excited for what's to come. Now, uh, your experience coming to Australia before the World Cup, getting signed, getting into the A-League Women's is fantastic, but Australia hosting this tournament, the fact we get to showcase uh, our stadiums, our football, the Australian culture, it's going to be a big magnet. So if people from other countries are watching, how would you describe your experience of breaking into the Australian football landscape, but going the long way, having to come in through the NPL, get yourself ID'd for the A-League Women's and then succeeding in the A-League Women's? Because I'm sure a lot of footballers around the world, men and women, but especially women, will be watching this World Cup and saying, all right, Australia is where I now want to go. Yeah, honestly, I think um, I've actually gotten like a lot of messages from friends back home who still do want to play. They're like, oh, like, what have you done? Like, what, what's going on? How are you getting there? How are you, like, I want to do what you're doing and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I think NPL was a perfect way to go. And um, doing that, just helped me get to where I am today. So I'm very grateful for the NPL, very grateful for the opportunity I got at Sydney FC. And I'm really excited about what's next for me. So the Americans, they've already had a 3-0 win against Vietnam. Um, you are split allegiances supporting <laughs> the Matildas and the United States. But tell us a bit about your thoughts on how America looked in that 3-0 win against Vietnam and your expectations for how they will go for the rest of the tournament. Yeah, I thought they did. I thought they did pretty well. I think, um, like I said before, you know, the first game is always so many jitters. It's, it's very fresh. There's a lot of new faces in the in the starting lineup. So I think just meshing together is also something that everyone needs to work on, not just USA, but just everyone, um, all of the teams. But yeah, I think, you know, they're going to be very strong, but I think not unbeatable. And give us an impression of how big a deal the United States women's team is in America, because all of us here in Australia are celebrating the amazing TV audiences and crowds for the Matildas, but the US women's national team, we're talking 25 million viewers for their games. We're talking a box office major event whenever they play. What is that culture like following the US women's team and sort of being someone who grew up following that team? Yeah, I mean, just those numbers alone are just like mind blowing. And, you know, you never know. I think, I think having the World Cup here in Australia and seeing how you know, women can play better and women can also play better than men sometimes. So I think having that here and seeing the new crowds coming in, I think the new fans coming in, I think that'll be huge. But yeah, I mean, obviously America has so many fans and I mean, also it does help that the population there is way bigger than Australia. So, um, but yeah, I think it's going to be very exciting what Australia will bring to the table and what's going to happen with Australian football. All right, uh, Taryn, let's get into today's games. Where would you like to start? Because the game that we've just walked out of, France against Jamaica, didn't give us a goal. Uh, would you like to maybe uh, pick the board for what caught your eye on uh, today's action? Well, we can start with France and Jamaica because while it didn't give us a goal, it did give us an upset. France, of course, heavily favoured to get the three points against Jamaica, weren't able to do so. Jamaica looked promising in attack by themselves as well. Could have nicked a goal on the counter, particularly that first 20 minutes. It really was Jamaica who looked like they were on top. And, you know, I think for France, it's, it's a real setback in this tournament. Rolly, you had some observations about the way France approached the game as they tried to break Jamaica down. Um, walking away, I understand, not too impressed with how they tried to find a way through to score. Yeah, I felt like they were only trying to score off of, you know, corners or maybe foul kicks. And, I mean, of course, they are a lot taller, a lot bigger and good in the air. But I feel like they're way, they're way, they're good enough to, you know, play through, get around. Um, but you know what? Jamaica held their own and I got to give props to them. They played phenomenal tonight. And, 
you know, I'm very impressed with what I saw and it was really exciting. Yeah, the stadium uh, definitely adopted Jamaica as the night went on and that corner right near the end uh, in the 90th minute had an almighty cheer. But after that corner, Taryn, a second yellow card for Khadija Bunny Shaw, it means that she'll be suspended for the game against Panama. Only that game because it was two yellow cards. I thought both yellows were marginal calls. I mean, it, even the one in the first half, she was uh, protesting quite vehemently. Do you think she's genuinely unlucky to have been sent off in this game? Yeah, perhaps a little bit unlucky. I mean, we can't read anything too much into her protesting the yellow cards. I don't think there's a footballer on earth who uh, wouldn't protest in that kind of situation. But yeah, borderline calls both times. Uh, nothing sort of egregiously incorrect, but I'm sure she'll feel miffed. And it's a huge loss for Jamaica, given that game against Panama on paper is the most winnable of the group. And Rolly, you yourself are a striker, and I'm sure you've been in situations where you have had to carry the burden of being responsible for both leading the line and scoring goals for your team. In a similar way to, to Bunny Shaw here, she's in the WSL, she is their star player. I mean, how much of a, a hole is that going to leave for Jamaica to try to fill? We saw at the Cup of Nations, they were able to score goals when uh, Bunny Shaw wasn't here in Australia for those three games, but this is the World Cup, and they really must wish that they did have a available now they won't yeah you know what I thought that second yellow was very that was a harsh call I thought you know even on the replay you could tell that she really went for the ball and she just kept sliding and like you know it just happens and also the whole game she's been carrying her team and actually the French players on her back as well you know so she's probably frustrated and you know I mean I don't blame her she was doing so well tonight and yeah not having her is going to be really Really painful for Jamaica, I feel. Taryn, a word on France. I thought uh, Clara Matteo getting booked early probably wasn't a factor in her getting subbed off, but I would have liked to have seen her and Kenza Daly on the pitch at the same time. As much as uh, the appointment of Hervé Renard meant the return of Eugenie Le Sommer, I'm not sure she's working in that, in that front line. And as we know, no Marie Antoinette Cototo in this tournament due to injury, but I didn't think their front two, you know, Diani, good, La Soma, not good. What, what were your impressions? Look, I think they've had similar problems to a lot of top teams that we've seen so far in this tournament in that rather than trying to play through teams and trying to use that technical ability, they're trying to play over teams. They're trying to play, they're trying to use their superior, I guess, physical ability to just muscle their way into winning games. And it's not happening anymore. The world of football is getting tighter. You know, these teams that maybe in the past they would have expected to walk over just on on physical attributes alone they can't do that anymore and i think that that really showed in france's performance tonight well let's talk about another team who tried and succeeded in doing exactly that sweden who scored in the last minute to beat south africa 2-1 the first and only game of this tournament where both teams have scored in the same game it hasn't been fantastic in terms of uh, momentum swings, but also competitive balance in that respect. Taryn, what were your impressions of uh, Sweden getting the late win after coming from behind? Uh, as a neutral, who wasn't a little bit devastated <laughs> at that late winner? I mean, South Africa, they scored the first goal and they were in the lead for so long. And, you know, when France, uh, sorry, not France, when Sweden got the equaliser, it did seem like the momentum had shifted significantly back into Sweden's favour. And then, of course, with the late header, yeah, I mean, a lot to take from the game from South Africa. They've never gotten a point at a World Cup before and unfortunately will be waiting a little while longer. But the other teams in their group now, they'll be scared because they know that South Africa can put up a fight. I mean, the Swedes were true to themselves. 13 corners, 14 unsuccessful open play crosses, three successful crosses, and they scored both their goals from crosses. They scored the winning goal from a corner, but 27 uh, crosses or set pieces like that roller. Just the Swedes have shown us how they're going to play. Is it good enough to beat an America? Is it good enough to beat a team like Spain? Yeah, I don't know. Like Taryn said, like there's so much talent nowadays. I don't think you can just go off of brutality and force and just try and get your body in front of everything. I think everybody's strong. Everybody's quick. Everybody's good. You know, like you have to go. I think you just have to play football at this point. <laughs>
Well, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure the Swedes are going to do that. I think they're going <laughs> to continue the cross spam and they are going to try and bludgeon teams that they go up against. But let's see if they can get away with it in their other two group games at least. All right, the other game was Netherlands 1, Portugal 0, another corner goal. Now, Taryn, we spoke a little bit about VAR yesterday. I thought for sure that Jill Ruud was going to be ruled to have been interfering with the goalkeeper's line of sight and offside. However, all the VAR marginal calls in this tournament have tended to go in favour of the bigger team or the higher ranked nation. I'm going to ask both of you, should the Netherlands goal have scored? Taryn? As a keeper, I would have been filthy had that stood because, you know, my mind goes back though to 2019 World Cup Mir Miracle of Montpellier where Sam Kerr in a very similar position was a judge to have not interfered with play uh, against Brazil and I believe it went down as an own goal and it was a kind of similar situation where she was in the vicinity but VAR judged that she wasn't interfering with the defender, she didn't get a touch and therefore the own, the, the own goal stood. So obviously this situation is a bit different because uh, Jill Rod was next to the keeper in this case but it seems to be with these decisions that if the player doesn't touch the ball, it tends to favour the attacking team. So, yeah, I, that's where my mind went when I saw that goal. But as I said, as a keeper, I, I would not have been happy. All right, let's get the striker's perspective then. Rolla, would you have given yeah, the goal? I don't know. So, when I watched it back, I felt like it was a bit unlucky because... I felt maybe the keeper thought that she was going to touch it. So she kind of was waiting for that second, like that reverse touch. So I don't know like if she went, because obviously I'm not a keeper, so I have no idea. But I felt like she was going to go to it. But then she saw that girl and she might have touched it. And then she was waiting for the second touch. So no, I, I, I agree. I actually <laughs> thought the keeper pulled her arms as well. Yeah. I, I actually agree with you on that. And I thought for all money, that's why it was going to get disallowed. But to be fair... Portugal created absolutely nothing in this game. One shot on target, 0.1 xG. Taryn, they kind of got what they deserved. They didn't try to score in this game. They were playing for a nil-all draw. They lost to an early goal. Yes, and that shot on target came, I believe, in the 82nd minute. So I think that says something about the game and the way that it panned out. The Netherlands were absolutely dominant for the majority of the game. It actually surprised me how dominant the Dutch were. I, I wasn't expecting them to be so dominant, but then again, only one goal. So maybe that says something about life without Viviana Miedema. Uh Rola, there's been a lot of talk about the t uh, tournament expanding to 32 teams. I personally will always take a 32-team tournament over a 24-team tournament purely because it means you can't finish third in your group and get through. Yeah. Even if it means we get a few one-sided games, and, and to be fair, we haven't so far. Do you think there's any merit in the discussion that the tournament has got too big too quickly? No, I don't know. I think I think it's good to have more teams. You know, more teams means more fans, more people watching. So I think I think we keep it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. All right, uh, let's take a quick look at tomorrow to wrap up in rapid fire fashion. All times Australian Eastern Standard Time, 4 p.m. in Auckland. It's Italy against Argentina. Rolla, this game could decide who goes through in the group. So who do you like? I'm taking Italy. Taryn. Italy 1-0. OK. Uh, <laughs> at 6.30pm in Melbourne, Germany against Morocco. Clear favourite, clear underdog, but the Moroccan team have really lent into what their men were able to do in Qatar at the Men's World Cup. Rolla, uh, who do you like in this one? You know what? I think I think a lot. everyone's thinking, you know, the favourites every single time to win, so I'm going to go Morocco. OK. Taryn? <laughs> I'll have to go with Germany. Let's go 2 1. Let's give them a go. <laughs> okay, and the last game is 9 pm in Adelaide, Brazil against Panama. Of course, Panama know that Bunny Shaw won't be uh, waiting for them when they face Jamaica in game two. Brazil, they will have seen France tonight and think, hey, we're a great chance of actually winning our group. So, Roller, who do you like, Brazil versus Panama? Definitely Brazil. I think it'll be 3 0. Wow, okay, and Taryn, what's your tip? Yes, I think Brazil will be too strong. I'll go 2-0. All right. Uh, well, Rola, thank you so much for joining us on Dub at the Cup. We're very excited for any breaking news that uh, involves you uh, and the A-League women's season in the near future. But in the meantime, still enjoy your off-season where you are still a defending champion of the league. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. And, of course, we're going to have plenty more current A-League women's players, coaches and former Matildas as part of Dub at the Cup. Taryn, where can people find more about our World Cup coverage? Well, you can find more on all of Keep Up's social platforms, so whether that's Twitter, whether you're an Instagram person or anything else, you can find 
us there. Also make sure that you follow Keep Up's YouTube channel where you'll find Dub at the Cup and other content. Thank you so much for listening. It's been a pleasure as always. I hope you're having a wonderful morning, afternoon or evening and goodbye.